Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is a real familiar passage of Scripture for most of us. Um, it's my prayer that we wouldn't allow that familiarity to get in the way of our study tonight. The Scripture teaches that the Lord is infinite. He's infinite. He can't be measured. His power, His understanding, His might, His person, He's infinite. He goes on and on and on and on and on and on forever and ever and ever and ever, eternity, past, present, future. He's infinite. And if that wasn't awesome enough, he's also intimate. And so the title of our study is Infinite Yet Intimate. He being infinite, needing nothing outside of himself, still chooses to be involved in our lives. And so it's important that we understand this because what we know about God will affect what we know about ourselves, how we view ourselves and not just ourselves, but how we look at everything else in our lives and everything around us. If our view of God is wrong, then our view of ourself will be wrong. Our view of others will be wrong. Our view of everything in our lives will be wrong. What we know of God is the most important thing. What you know of God is the most important thing in your life because it determines everything else in your life. And in this psalm, David is going to tell us that God knows us intimately. And then he's going to tell us that God is with us completely. And then he's going to tell us that God made us wonderfully. And lastly, he's going to tell us that God judges us righteously. And understanding those truths are important for you and me as we function and operate in life. And we'll discuss that as we make our way through here. In verse 1, David says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. That word searched in the Hebrew carries this idea of examining with painstaking care. The Hebrews, the Jewish people, use this term to describe those who dig deep in a mine to find gold and precious metals. They use it to describe someone who is exploring land or surveying, getting, getting boundaries just right. They use it to describe someone who's investigating a legal matter. It takes care. It takes painstaking care to examine. It's not a casual thing. It's a very careful thing. But notice David says, thou hast searched me and known me. Now we know the scripture teaches us that God's understanding is infinite. So God already knows you. Inside and out, forwards and backwards, past, present, future, he knows you, and yet, he searches you. I can only hope and pray that the Holy Spirit will allow some of these truths to really settle. He is infinite, yet intimate. A God who knows everything searches you. A God who knows everything about you still searches you. It's like having a rock collection or, or, or something of that nature. You know what's in the box. You've looked at it a thousand times, but periodically you take that box out just to peruse your treasure. You know it already. 
You could tell someone, well, I've got an amethyst in there and I've got this chrysolite in there. And wow, I found this really cool nugget of fool's gold in there back when I, you already know what's in there, but you, because it's a value to you, because you're interested, because you're intimately involved with what's in your treasure box, you search it, you keep looking. God knows you and yet he searches you. He takes time to look at you. The Bible says the very hairs of our head are numbered. That's interesting. They're numbered. The scripture doesn't say the very hairs of our head are known, which is true. They are known. But why would someone that knows how many hairs number them? One, two, three. He's infinite, yet intimate. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat this drum because we need to understand how much the Lord loves us and cares about us because what we know of God will depend on what we know about ourselves, what we know of others, and how we'll view everything else in our lives. It's important that we understand. You've searched me, Lord, carefully, painstakingly. You know everything there is to know about me. We sing a chorus sometimes here. The one who knows me best loves me most. Now we go out of our way most of the time so that people will not know us. Most of us don't want people knowing the real us. That's why we, we take great care on social media to craft and to, to picture. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm a people observer and I, I don't know. I, I, I do that all the time. And, and I'll have to confess, I look at some of my friends' Facebook pages and I know them. They're not just, now some people are just friends on Facebook. I know them from a friend of a friend or a family. I really don't know them even though we're friends on Facebook. But I have real friends who are also friends on Facebook. And I, I chuckle kind of on the inside sometimes when I look at their posts. Because I'm like, that's really not who they are. That's what they post. That's what they want the world to think. But that's not the real them. And I'm sure I'm guilty too, right? We, we, put, we put our best pictures out there. We, we say things that we want people to think we think. Or we want people to think we like or know or believe or whatever it might be. You've searched me, Lord. And you know me. The Lord knows us intimately. Here's the follow-up that's not in the outline for you note-takers. We cannot deceive him. Amen. The Lord knows us intimately. We cannot deceive him. So it would be my utmost prayer tonight that everyone in this room who knows the Lord, who now knows the Lord knows them, if you didn't before, would drop the act. Would just drop it. Cease and desist. That you would learn with the help of the Holy Spirit a word that is in the process of transforming my life. And it's this, honesty. Honesty. Now, here's what's interesting. Socrates, that great philosopher, and then later on, Aristotle come along after him, and they said that the foundation of wisdom and knowledge, understanding was this. Man, know thyself. Know thyself. It sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, modern psychology and modern philosophy and they're all about it still. We need to know ourselves and understand ourselves. And you know what the problem with that is? 
Anybody? The problem with that is it's a fallacy <laughs> because you can't know yourself apart, listen, from knowing God. So if you follow the world and the world tells you you need to know yourself, explore yourself, understand who you are, we are more mixed up in our identities today than we ever have been in all of human history. So we've been practicing know yourself all this time and we know less about ourselves than we ever have. And it's because we know less about God than we ever have. I want to read two passages of scripture from Jeremiah. It's found in Jeremiah 17. Now Socrates, Aristotle says, know yourself. This is what Jeremiah says. The first verse is going to be familiar. You've probably heard it a lot. The heart is deceitful. Listen, above. The heart is deceitful above. Listen, pay attention. You got to get this. Hear the words of God. The heart is deceitful above all things. I want to read that again because sometimes we just brush over a truth and we're just like, phew, fly by, not looking at the speed limit and we don't, we don't see... The heart is deceitful above all things. There is nothing more deceitful on planet earth than your heart. We know it's in here, but do we? I, I'm, not, I'm not a deceiver. That's the problem with know thyself. That's the problem with self-evaluation. That's the problem with all of that psychoanalyzing ourselves. The only safe place to do it is at the altar. That's the only safe place for this process to take place because I don't know myself. That's why God has been just whipping this boy for about a year and a half to two years about judging other people. Because if I don't know me, then how in the world do I think I know you? If I can't know my own heart, how can I look at you and judge yours? It, it really throws the whole thing, right? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then he follows up with this. Who can know it? But verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins or the innermost part of us, that will, that motive, that determining factor of why and what we do even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. In Psalm 19, if you remember way back when we, wow, it just seems like forever, doesn't it? In Psalm 19, the psalmist says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also, right, from presumptuous sins that they not rule over me. He's like, I, I, don't, I don't know me. The psalmist and Jeremiah both say we, we can't know ourselves. So this searching process is important. The fact that God is intimately involved in my life. He is searching me. He knows me. He's searching you. He knows you. Now some would hear this truth and think, okay, I better run. I better hide. Now the psalmist is going to deal with that. But let me just tell you right up front, don't do that. If you run, run to him. If you hide, hide in him, right? Not from him. He says, O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Lord, you know my ups and you know my downs. You know all my ups and all my downs. You know my uprising and my downsitting. That means when you walked in here tonight, you were sitting down in your vehicle. 
The Lord knew that. You opened the door and you stood up from your vehicle. He knew that. You walked in here, you found your seat, and you sat down. After we prayed, I said, let's stand. And you stood, and the Lord knew. After worship, you sat back down. At the end of this study, you're going to stand. He knows my uprising and my down sitting. He's infinite, yet intimate. Who pays attention to you that much? Your mom loves you. Your dad loves you, but not even they pay that much attention to you. You don't even pay that much attention to yourself. We're not always thinking, okay, I'm going to sit down now. Okay, I'm going to... We just, we just do these things, but the Lord knows. It's not just that he knows. Infinitely, intimately, he knows. This truth will change our lives. Understanding these attributes of the Lord and what they mean to us. He says, thou understandest my thought afar off. This is especially beautiful to me. How many have ever had something in your head that you wished wasn't in your head? Yeah, me too. How many have had stuff in your head that you didn't want in your head and was in your head? You were shocked that it was in your head and you didn't want it and you wish you could get it out of your head, but it's there in your head. Can, 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 can I give you a little bit of encouragement tonight? You know my thoughts afar off. Do you know what that means? You know the thought before I think the thought. When that thought that shocks you, oh, God wasn't shocked. He's not going, oh, Gordon. The one who knows me most or knows me best loves me most. Before he saved this young man, who's not so young anymore. He knew every thought that would pass through here. And not just those that would pass. He knows the ones that would linger, that I would latch on to and develop. And yet he saved me still and loves me still. Infinite yet intimate. He knows everything everything about me. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. Someone is always watching. God is always watching. He's always observing. I shared with you, I'm a people watcher. I, I, I don't know, I just, I'm a weirdo maybe. I just, I live just observing. The Lord observes his people. He's watching. When I lay down and take a couple deep breaths and my wife's talking to me and I never finish the conversation because it doesn't take me long to fall asleep. He knows when I lie down and he watches over me. Later on in the psalm, the psalmist is going to say, when I wake up, you're still there. You're still there. You ever sat by somebody's sick bed? You ever been there and then they kind of wake up and they just, and they're like, oh, hey. They're like, you're here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. The Lord does that for every one of us. Some of you might be afraid to go to sleep because of what might happen to you while you're asleep. Don't be afraid because he watches over you when you lay down. David says that in the Psalms. I laid down and the Lord woke me up. He sustained me. He was so bold about it. David says, I will both lay me down and sleep in peace for the Lord only makes me dwell in safety. Hmm. 
for there is not a word in my tongue. But lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. You know everything that I think before I think it. You know everything I say before I say it. In John chapter 2, John says, Jesus didn't commit himself to any man because he knew what was in man. He didn't need anybody to tell him what was in man because he already knew. The Father knows what I need before I even ask. But Jesus said, ask that my joy might be full. When I go to the Lord in prayer, it's not to inform him of something that he doesn't know. And if that's the way you pray, I would encourage you to stop praying like that. Lord, you know my boss and he's, the Lord knows all of that. Start praying like God already knows. And start praying like it is a joy to be able to bring that to the one who already knows. Most of you in this room, when you already know information, you're a little bit short and impatient to sit and listen to someone tell you something that you already know. No, because you're busy and get time for that. Tell me something I don't know. The one who is infinite is yet intimate. Have you ever thought about that? That every prayer you pray, God already knows. He knows all the facts. He knows what you're going to pray before you pray it. He already knows what he's going to do before you ask him. He knows what everybody else involved in the whole thing is going to do. He knows the beginning from the end and yet he listens. <laughs> and I, I, I don't praise him more than I already do. I mean, we could, stop this, we could stop the psalm right here and that would be enough for us to just praise him until we had no more energy and no more breath. Amen. He knows every word of my mouth. But lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. You have beset me behind and before. That word beset there means to hedge or to put a guard around. It's like when Satan went before the Lord and the Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, well, yes, but I can't touch him because you have a hedge about him. The Lord. I've been reading through Genesis again and in Genesis chapter 15, the Lord appears to Abraham in a vision and he says, fear not, Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Think about God surrounding you. Wow. You've beset me behind and before, and you've laid your hand upon me, behind my past, taken care of. You go before my future, taken care of. Your hand is upon me, my present, right now. He's got me covered. He's got you covered. He surrounds you. Verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. This is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. I, I, I'm amazed, Lord, that you would really... May the Lord give us back that childlike wonder and that childlike faith to read a text like this and go, wow, <laughs> what? Yeah. What kind of God is this? Amen. Do you know how good you are? And it's that kind of thing. Of course he knows, right? His knowledge is, but do, really? <laughs> it's amazing. I want to read one more passage of scripture before we get past this, this section of God knows us intimately. If I can find, yes. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, what's interesting is that is said before we go into having a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities and that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. He know, we're naked and open. God knows us intimately. We cannot deceive him. Ananias and Sapphira, 
bebop up into the church. And we, we pick on them. We point at them. We talk about how bad they are. But how many times does the hypocrite walk into the church so that you all see one thing? He knows me. I can't deceive him. So why don't I just let that go? Why don't I just be honest with him and honest with you and be real? Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. You ever thought how humorous it is? Adam, Adam, where are you? If it wasn't such a serious thing that took place, the, the, the fall of humanity, but there they are. And Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I, I hid myself. I hid myself. The writer of Hebrews just told us everything is naked and open before the eyes of him of whom we have to do. He, he, he sees right through us. All the masks, all the, all the Facebook, all the social media, all the Christianese that we speak and, and all that, the church entity stuff. He sees all through that. And there he is, Adam's hiding. Have you ever played hide and go seek with a little bitty toddler? It's, it's fun. It, it, it's cute. They go running in their bedroom and crawl underneath the blanket. There's this big lump in the middle of the bed in the shape of the little toddler. And they're hiding. And they're moving a little bit like, he can't see me. <laughs> like, I got this great hiding spot, right? <laughs> Where are you? You know, it's that kind of thing. That's Adam. That's Eve. Maybe he'll pass by. He won't see us. And we'll be able to have a better cover-up before tomorrow when he shows back up in tomorrow's cool of the day. Every escape route you have is futile. We're going to see that in the next section. It's futile. We can't hide. We can't deceive him. And what would life be? I tell you what life would be. What would life be if we would just start being honest with God? Psalm 51, I say it a lot. I'm going to keep saying it. It's a verse that's changed my life. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part and in the hidden part. This is the result of truth in the inward part. And in the hidden part, that part that I can't see, that part that I can't know because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. It is in knowing the Lord and him revealing himself and me to me that I know who I am. Socrates had it wrong. Aristotle had it wrong. The only way I can know me, and I know things about me that I could never have known apart from God revealing it to me. There are things in my life that God has delivered me from that my wife told me was in my life for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, and I denied it. I made excuses for it. I explained it away. No, that's not me. That's not who I am. Yes, it is, honey. That's who you are. That's what you do. No, I don't. I don't. You got me mixed up with somebody else until finally in prayer, being real with the Lord, praying the prayer that the psalmist is going to pray at the end of this psalm. God reveals. And I'm like, oh. Wow, I, 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 I didn't, I never saw, I didn't know. Thank you. Because now when he reveals it, I know he can do something about it. So like Paul in Corinthians, I don't judge myself anymore. No more psychoanalyzing, mumbo, I don't get to the end of my day and go, okay, now did I say everything that I was supposed to say? Now did I have the right response? I don't do that anymore. That just left me confused and tormented. Now I just get in God's presence and let him do what he's going to do in me and change what he's going to change in me. So I challenge you. 
I really do. Start being real with the Lord. Get alone with God in your prayer closet, in your quiet time, driving to work, whenever that time is for you, wherever that place is for you, and say, Lord, you know me. If anybody knows me, you know me. And I don't even know myself. I think I know me, but I don't. And the me that I'm trying to get everybody else to see is really not the real me that I am. And so I'm asking you, Lord, I want to know me like you know me. And the only way I can do that is to get to know you. And so here I am. And tomorrow, I'm going to be back here. And the next day, I'm going to be back here. Because I'm going to focus on knowing you, not knowing me. I'm going to focus on knowing you, but I'm going to be real with you in that process of getting to know you. And I'm going to believe that you are going to deal with the real me that I am. And you're going to make me the me that you want me to be. <laughs> wow. Verse 7. The Lord is with us constantly. We can't escape him. We can't escape him. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? How many of you ever felt like God had abandoned you? How many of you know that that feeling was false? Where, the psalmist says, where can I go? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I go as high as humanly possible, you're there. If I go as low as humanly possible, you're there. Because God created both heaven and hell. He is everywhere. There is no place that he is not. So the next time you feel lonely, notice I didn't say alone because you are never alone. You may feel lonely, but you are never alone. He is with you constantly. Constantly. He says, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He says, if I take the wings of the morning, which means if I rise at the break of day as the sun's rising across the horizon and shooting its rays out like wings, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. There's a guy in the Bible who tested this. His name was Jonah. He tried to run from the Lord. It, you ought to read it if you have never read it. I'm sure you've heard of it, but if you never read it, you need to read it. It's a whale of a tale. You, <laughs> you need to read it. You cannot run from the Lord. You can't. You can't get away from him. He says, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me. Hopefully you've never been into a bar, but I'm sure some of you have been in a bar. But if you have been in a bar, they're dark. I'm not aware of any that you go into and they're like super, super bright, like a clean, open, airy place with all these bright lights. They're, they're dark. John talks about this in John chapter 1. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They, they go to these dark places because, well, you know, they think. But the psalmist says, darkness doesn't, distance doesn't keep you from me. Darkness doesn't keep you from me. He says, the night is light about me. Because of your presence, it can't get dark enough to hide from you. If I say darkness shall cover me, it, it won't happen. Verse 12, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. The night shineth as the day. The darkness is as light. Darkness and light are both alike to thee. So I can be in a dark place, but when God's there, it's not a dark place. Now, now I'm going to give you something to kind of a mind bender. You hear believers say, man, I was in a dark place. If you're a believer, 
you weren't in a dark place. If I shall say, surely darkness shall cover me, even darkness shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. It might have felt dark. But if God's with you, it's not dark. Because he is light. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. I know this. Notice what he says, and he's going to say it multiple times. You made me. We're not evolving. We didn't evolve. We were made. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has made us wonderfully. We cannot ignore him. We can't ignore him. We're made in his image. Verse 15 says, my substance, in the Hebrew that means, that, that means a wrapped mass. My substance was not hid from thee, when I was made, there it is again, made in secret and curiously wrought. That phrase in the Hebrew carries the idea of embroidery work or needlework, something that is woven together. So he says, my substance, which is a wrapped mass, I'm curiously wrought. I'm woven together like needlework in the lowest part of the earth. The lowest part of the earth is the nucleus of a cell. In the very lowest part of the earth, look what he says. Thine eyes did see my substance, yes, being, yet being unperfect at conception before I was even an embryo. And in thy book... All my members were written. Notice my members, if you have a King James Bible, my members is in italics, meaning it was added for the sake of our understanding in the English. But if you have a margin that explains the Hebrew, all my days were written. All the days of my life were written in your book. Wow. When as yet there was none of them. So we have a wrapped mass that's curiously wrought and it's written. Double helix, DNA, written code. God made us. Now, I, I'm, I'm not super smart. I read this. <laughs> so if it's wrong, then blame it on the scientist that said it. Scientists say, and I'm sure the numbers vary from scientist to scientist because they do that a lot with different things. There's, there's more than 30 trillion cells in our bodies. That's a bunch. If it's true, I, it's a lot. And here's what they say about them. If you took one of those cells and you took, you unraveled the DNA which is the blueprint of each one of our bodies. In, in every cell, it's written. That blueprint is written. If you took one cell and unraveled the DNA, the code that is written, and put it end to end, it would go the distance from the earth to the sun a hundred times. One cell. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully and wonderfully made. God knew us before we could be known. John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit in his mother's womb. Jeremiah the Lord said, I knew you. We just studied that Paul said, God called me right before I was even born. He has written 
that in his book? The psalmist says, you have written all my tears in your book. He said, you collect them in a bottle. Are they not written in your book? There's a book of remembrance for the times that I gather like tonight. This is being written down. This has been written in the annals of heaven. And the book of Revelation tells us that there are going to be books open in the end. There's a book of life where my name is written. He wrote my story before I ever was. Infinite yet intimate. God is not some distant God that doesn't care about you and is not aware of what's going on in your life. So you need to stop living like that. We need to start living according to the truth. God is infinite, yet intimate. He knows everything about me. Intimate means into me. Intimacy is into me. You see? That's intimacy in a very basic form. He's into me. He's into you. He cares about what you care about. He can be touched with the feelings of your infirmities. God is involved with your life. Yes. <sighs> Verse 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. God thinks about you. Now this, I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I'm, there's, this, there's this paradox through this whole psalm. God knows everything about me, and yet he thinks about me. He meditates on me. It's like, I know John 3, 16. I know it. 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 But I can meditate on it. I can meditate on it. God knows me, and yet he thinks about me. The least I could do is think about him some. I mean, he's constantly thinking about me. Right now, he's thinking about me. He's thinking about you. He knows those of you who are thought, okay, we're almost done. Just a few more. He knows what you thought. He knows that. He knows if you're here because you want to be here, if you're here because mom's made you be here. I mean, he knows. But he thinks about us. And those thoughts are precious thoughts. Prized thoughts, not I tell you what, that Gordon, when is he ever going to get it right, right? I mean, all these years, he's been walking with me for over 30 years, and he's still... No, precious are the thoughts that he thinks. So how can I think about my life, or the traffic jam, or every red light on the way to work that I'm already late? Look, if you're already late, don't worry. You can't be late twice. <laughs> Just relax and go on to work. You're already... Okay. That was, that was free little. He thinks of me. He thinks of you. I, I, that boggle, I, I'm, I'm struggling up here. I don't want to think of me. But he thinks of me. Precious thoughts. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, he might think of me here now and then. No, look at this. Look at this. How precious also are thy thoughts toward me, O God. Exclamation. Oh, he says, how great is the sum of them? Not just every now and then, not just a little bit, a whole lot. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. Ever been to the beach? There's a place out at Fort Pickens. You can go to Fort Pickens, go to the very end. Amazing sunsets, right? If there's a place you want to check out sunsets, it's amazing. We go there and you know, I don't get in the water or anything, but I've got my shoes on. And we just kind of, I try to carefully walk out to a place so we can kind of just sit there and watch the sunset. And, and I'm trying my best not to get sand in my shoe. You can't do it. It's everywhere. It sticks everywhere. If you don't think there's a lot of sand on the seashore, the next time you go, grab your handful. And while you're sitting there, count just the handful. Give it a try. Just a handful. The psalmist David says, you think of me that much. Just rapid. I mean, I can't even constantly. What's amazing is he's thinking about all of us the same amount right now. At the same time. 
when I awake, I'm still with thee. David's like, is this a dream? Are you kidding me? Another day and all of this all over again. What? Some believers are like, another day. What you know about God will change what you know about you and about everything around you. And no matter what you're going through, maybe you're dealing with sickness, maybe you're dealing with sorrow, maybe you're dealing with, with things in life that aren't going the way you want them to go. But God knows. Knowing that God knows is comforting. Because it's tempting to feel like, if this is all happening, are you on vacation? Have you forgotten me? No. It's written in his book. Just keep turning the page. It's going to get gooder and gooder and gooder. The end. Wow. Think about this. If we're so fearfully, wonderfully made in the natural, can you imagine what the eternal is going to be? If it's, if it's this intricate and intimate, this side of heaven, right? Now, the psalmist is going to take this abrupt turn. I mean, we're just talking about how glorious it is that God knows us and we can't escape him. And notice this, it just takes this. And some people are like, wait a minute, this is out of place. It's not out of place. Because remember what we said at the beginning of our study. What you know of God will determine what you think of yourself, what you think of others, and what you think about the world around you. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. God will judge us righteously. We can't dispute him. Whatever he says goes. There's no need in arguing with him. Right? So sin, whatever he says is sin, is sin. Whatever he says is right, is right. Whatever he says is wrong, is wrong. Stop arguing with him. Save yourself a lot of heartache. Because you can't dispute him. Surely you will slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. A lot of Christians do too. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieve with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Whoa, what? What? Our modern mindset and philosophies can't handle the truth. Just can't. <gasps> what? David, you take it back. If David were here, he'd say, I ain't taking it back. Now, I'm going to say something, and I hope it shocks you. A faithful servant, a faithful servant will be interested in what his master is interested in. A faithful servant will love what his master loves. And a faithful servant will hate what his master hates. And the God of love hates the Bible says there are things that he hates. Proverbs chapter 6. There are things that he hates. And multiple scriptures where, God, where it says God hates the wicked. God hates evil. Now we know God doesn't hate the sinner. He hates the sin. And Psalm 97 tells us to love God. This is going to help you evaluate your love of the Lord. To love the Lord is to hate evil I can't say I love God if I don't hate evil because God hates evil this is what David is saying God I'm on your side now Joshua remember when the, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Joshua Josh, Joshua says are you for us or against us and that's what's wrong with uh, the political church today and that's what's wrong with the denominational church today. Because like Joshua, we're too busy trying to determine whose side God is on. Is God a Republican? Or is God a Democrat? Or is God an Independent? Is God a Baptist? Or is he a Pentecostal? Or is he a Presbyterian? Or is he a Methodist? Or is he Catholic? 
right? We're all, whose side are you on? Who's, God's on our side. No, he ain't. He's on our side. God's on our side. Whose side are you on? And the angel of the Lord said, neither. I'm the captain of the Lord's host. We need, like David, understand. When I understand who God is and who I am to him, my heart's desire shouldn't be, Lord, come over here and be on our team. My heart's desire should be, I'm with you, God. I'm with the one who knows me. I'm with the one who knows my thoughts, knows my words, who numbers my hairs, who knows my uprising and my downsitting. I'm with the one who fearfully and wonderfully made me. I'm the one who thinks of me, precious thoughts, more than the grains of the sand on the seashore. I'm with him. I'm with him. Whoever's with him, I'm with them. Whoever's against him, I'm against them. I'm with him. It changes every aspect of my life, every way that I live, every way that I think, everything everything this is why it's so important that we know God we need to know him and then he ends it with this two verses we're going to end early search me O oh God search me now this is interesting remember verse one? O oh Lord thou hast searched me and known me now David knows and he's just told us, right, by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, he already knows that God has already searched him. He already knows that God already knows him intimately. His thoughts, his words, his uprising, his down sittings. He knows everything about David. And now David is saying, listen, and we need to do this. You need to do this. If you didn't get anything from tonight, get this. David is now saying, will you please let me be part of your search? I want to be a part of that search. So he says, search me, O oh God. Search me. Look what he says. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. He's already told us that he knows. He knows that God knows. But he also knows that God is searching. Because God is intimately involved in David's life and in my life and in your life. And so he knows that God is thinking of him and watching him and observing him and knowing him. And so David says, I want to be a part of it. I want to get in on this because there's a benefit to me, just like he learned in Psalm 51. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part and in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. If we could get this, God will let you know stuff that you otherwise could not know. And living a life with that kind of knowledge is transforming. Knowing you, not what they think you are, not what you want to be, but who you are and who he wants you to be. See, David understood this. Jesus understood this. That's why in Mark chapter 1, we're told that he rose up a great while before day and went to a solitary place and said, Lord, you wrote my story. I want to make sure I'm on the right page with you today. Constantly, Jesus prayed to stay in tune with the Father. He says, I only say what the Father wants me to say. I only do what the Father wants me to do. I have come to finish the work of my Father. I want to glorify Him. Oh, it's a beautiful way to live our lives. And so David says, search me, O oh God, know my heart. Try me. It's the idea in the Hebrew of testing metal. Try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. David is saying, show me me. I know Christians who come to church Sunday after Sunday and they make excuses for bad behavior over and over again. They'll shake the pastor's hand and say, pastor, if they'd have been here, you'd have got them. Never applying it to themselves. I wish my wife was here. She needed to hear that. You know, what, or that kind of thing. Search me, O oh God, not search him, not search them, search me, know my heart, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me. And then what he says, what did he say? <laughs> and lead me in the way everlasting. David says, I know there's a way. And that way is everlasting. And David understood, we can get a lot of things wrong in life, but not the everlasting. You cannot afford to get the everlasting wrong. And there's only one who knows that way. He is the everlasting one. 
He is the way. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I want to read a passage of scripture to you as we close in Jeremiah chapter 35. If I can find it here. Verse 8. Jeremiah says, And an highway shall be there. And a way, yes. <laughs> and a way. Lead me in the way everlasting. And a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be for those. Notice, notice who it's for. The wayfaring men. Though fools, though fools shall not err therein. This fool is walking in the way everlasting because I'm in on the search. I'm in on the search. I'm like, Lord, I want to read your report. I want daily briefings of your search. What do you see, Lord? What do you see in me? What do you say about me? I'm, cha I'm throwing down the chat. I double dog dare you. <laughs> I don't know how else. If, I'm sure there's something greater than that. <laughs> Triple dog dare you. Right? <laughs> Tonight before you go to bed, matter of fact, in this last song, where you stand, begin this process, Lord. I, I, I've, I read several commentators and, and I scratched them out. I, I put X's through them. I, I was shocked. Many of them said, this is a dangerous prayer. You shouldn't pray this prayer. Like, you dumb. <laughs> Everybody should pray this prayer. All of us should be, search me, Lord, search me, search me, know me, try me, point out what's wrong, because when you point it out, I know you're going to fix it, right? You're going to reveal in here things that I never, ever, ever would have known. And he's changing me and he's changing you and he wants to do even more.